Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Livingston, and I'm here for another edition of Quorum Live, our series of conversations with Quorum Initiative members and friends about hot topics that relate to women and careers today. Um, the Quorum Initiative is an organization based in New York, London, and Washington, D.C., and soon to be St. Joseph's um, outside of Kansas City, which is exciting. And we, our mission is to create a direct pathway for women to leadership roles so that they can reach the C-suite more easily. We also are drawing attention to investing in women-led and owned businesses and venture capital um, to those businesses. So for more information about Quorum Initiative, check out our website and our YouTube channel. I'm so thrilled today to welcome my guest, uh, Donna Rubin. Donna is a consultant, speechwriter, and speaker focused on expanding diverse voices and viewpoints in the public discourse. She works with organizations to develop their talent and support underrepresented voices in becoming recognized experts, brand ambassadors, and role models for the next generation. This is so tied in with Quorum Initiative's mission. An award-winning journalist, she lives in New York where she writes and speaks about the history of women's speech and voice. Donna created the Speaking While Female Speech Bank to broaden our understanding of who actually spoke in history. Visit speakingwhilefemale.co to find thousands, literally thousands of speeches by women from around the world and across time. Donna, thank you so much for being here today. And I wanna show everyone uh, a photo of your, a, a screenshot of your new book, um, Speaking While Female. So there has been so much upheaval around women's rights recently. It's, it's kind of, it's frightening, it's disconcerting and upsetting. Roe versus Wade was, was overturned last year. There's continuing controversy around birth control and abortion rights for women. Why is your book so timely right now? Well, thank you. First of all, let me say thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to Meg and everybody who's gotten Quorum Initiative off the ground and so successful. It really is extremely important that we support women leaders, our generation, the next generation of women leaders, women entrepreneurs, women funders. It's, it's fundamentally critical. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I'm honored to be here with you. And Julie, let me answer your question the roundabout way. First of all, I want to start with a question. And then I'll answer your question. Great. Everybody who's listening today, whether it's live or whether you're watching on um, on a on a video on um, YouTube on YouTube or somewhere else, take out just a piece of paper, small piece of paper, and jot down really quickly some famous speakers in history. Just jot down two or three people who come to mind, famous speakers in history. I won't pause for very long. I'll keep going. But I give a lot of workshops and talks about the history of women's speech. And, I can and I've been doing this for a couple of years. And I can tell you that almost everybody in our culture can name famous male speakers. So the names that frequently come to mind, of course, are people like Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, JFK and his brother MLK, Ronald Reagan, Billy um, uh, the Preacher. What's his, Billy? Billy Graham. Billy Graham, sorry, didn't come to mind. So very hard for people to mention as many women speakers. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I'm actually just looking at my little, my quick list here. I had JFK because I grew up reading that book, Profiles and Courage, Eleanor Roosevelt and Gloria Steinem. Well, good. You did wetter than most because you came up with two. <laughs> the names that sometimes come to mind, I'll just give you a few of them. Sometimes people say Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Occasionally, Eleanor Roosevelt, maybe Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama and Oprah. But generally speaking, people do not associate speaking or oratory with women. The whole act of standing in public, sharing your views, 
putting your expertise out into the world is considered a male thing to do, a man's thing to do. And that goes back very far. I mean, it goes all the way back to ancient times. Ancient Greek and Roman rhetoric was considered an emblematic of a male virtue. Okay. Men, men went into the public forum. Men discussed politics and big ideas. And that carried through to, to contemporary times, to modern times. And of course, we have many, many... Um, De decades, years of men taking rhetoric classes, men taking public speaking, men joining debate clubs, and women were not trained, encouraged, or respected when they put their ideas into the world, when they step up and spoke as experts, when they gave testimony, either in a panel or even congressional testimony or in a courtroom, women's voices and ideas have not been considered authoritative and credible. So, so you, we, start, you started I mean, by asking yeah. why. So that's yeah. why. I mean, we know that women have things to say. They have, we have brains, we have thoughts and ideas. Um, do you think that the lack of access to education, um, obviously you think it's a big barrier, but do great orators really need to have professional training or is it a natural gift or a combination? Oh, that's a that's a that's a whole nother subject. Uh, professional training for speakers. Um, let me say that women's voices throughout history have been just as important as men's. And even though men were um, championed and got the spotlight, women were speaking. Um, but yes, skip to, uh, skipping to modern times, everybody can benefit from public speaking coaching and public speaking help. And I encourage all women to get support. But the single most important ingredient for powerful and effective and memorable speaking is experience. There's just right. nothing like getting up and speaking over and over and over. Because as you do, you accumulate confidence um, and security and putting your ideas into the world. Yeah. And you get from, you familiarize yourself even with the kinds of language you're going to use to express your ideas and, you know, the phrases and buzzwords or catchphrases that are really uh, going to enlighten and, and power up your message. That's right. I think of it as mastery over your material. You have all your, all your information at your fingertips. You have the facts and dates. And that's so important when you want to convey credibility, when you want to be considered a leader in your field. You need to have all of the data points. You need to have the evidence-based arguments to back up what you're saying. Absolutely. So why have women's speeches then been uh, perhaps unrecognized or underrecognized, hidden or hard to find? And tell us a little bit about how you uncovered some of these gems. Okay. So why have they been so hard to find? We all know that there's something called gatekeepers, gatekeepers of knowledge, gatekeepers of the past, gatekeepers of ideas. And those people would be like historians, like editors and publishers of books and newspapers, anthologies, um, even in the media, the larger media, even producers in the media world and the film world. These are all the people who green light ideas, who say, go ahead, I'll put some resources behind that. So, oh, so here's a scenario I often mention. Just imagine some undetermined time, unspecified time in history, a woman's giving a speech. It could be the it could be the 18th century, it could be the 19th century, it could be contemporary times. A woman's giving a speech. Who goes to hear her? Who knows about it? Is there a reporter there who's going to write down what she says? Is there someone with a video camera if it's contemporary times? Who chronicles what she says? And the next step is, the next question is, how do they make that knowledge known to the public? So if you're talking about earlier times, then if men didn't value what women had to say and men did not credit women as sources of authority, they didn't put any resources behind her speaking. And so her words, unfortunately, were lost to time. So my project, my project was to excavate really in an archaeological sense to go to the archives, to go to the out of print books, to go to old newspapers and dig up what women had to say 
and then put them into uh, this website that you mentioned. It's an archive with thousands of speeches by women. Speakingwhilefemale.co. This is such an exciting uh, venture that you've embarked on, uh, Donna. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I can imagine um, how enlightening it's going to be for for all women to really see how we've had vo a voice throughout history and and the, the way our thinking has evolved as well. Right. And I'll tell you, some of um, some of our listeners today might be familiar with Mary Beard. She's one of um, she's one of my heroes. She's a British classicist. She teaches history, uh, history of ancient Greek and Rome um, at Cambridge in the in England. She wrote a book a few years ago called Women and Power, a Manifesto. I read that book. I devoured it the instant it came out. And she writes about the silencing of women through history, how since ancient times to the present, women have been silent. They've been told you cannot speak. Right. When they tried to speak, they were told to stand down. They or weren't shut allowed, down. Yeah. weren't allowed to be ministers until 1850s. They no Christ, no major Christian denomination had ordained a woman. Anyway, so across the board, her argument is that women have been silenced. And the, she's a, a great scholar whom I admire enormously. But I will say this, what my research has shown is that every time women were silenced or every time there was a move to silence women, women pushed back. Women did speak at great duress. They were harassed. They were calumnied in the press. Their reputations were trashed. There were objects thrown at them. They were um, insulted and abused right and left, but still women spoke. So who were the earliest female orators that you discovered and how did they get their messages across? They didn't have digital media like we have today. Right. Well, let's just contain this, um, my answer to America, because my, sure. my latest book focuses on United States women. I don't cover the entire um hemisphere of America, North and South continents, but it is a North America. It is a U.S. based endeavor. And looking at women in the United States, a little known um, fact, or even you might say whole um, chapter of history is that the first women speakers were indigenous women. Of course, there were, you know, North America was covered with clans or tribes, and then many of them, women were, there was, they were matrilineal or matriarchal. And that means women had positions of power and influence and women did speak. <clears throat> they spoke in leadership positions. They spoke to their communities. They were involved in treaty negotiations. <clears throat> women were speaking in indigenous communities, but most of those communities did not have written language for the most part. What they said was not written down. And of course they were speaking in their own languages. And so we have very little record of what we said, which tears at my heart. It really does break my heart. Yeah. Now, one of the earliest speeches I have in this anthology is by an indigenous woman, a Cherokee woman named Nan Yehis, who spoke as a treaty negotiator in the 1780s the only reason we know what Nanya he said is because her words were written down by the Anglo representatives of the United States who were there keeping a record um, of the negotiation. So they wrote it down and there's a scrap of paper in the Library of Congress. I've seen a picture of it. It's yellowed and it's torn. So we don't even have a complete record. But the fragment of what she said is in my book. Wow, and she that's so exciting, especially now that there's been a renewed emphasis and interest in Native American voices. Absolutely. And then Yehi asks for peace. She says, our people are your people. My people are your people. We must ensure peace for all our people and our children. That was Nen Yehi. So can you imagine how many tens of thousands of voices were lost? Now, the next group of women who are unappreciated or ministers there were women of every denomination who were traveling the eastern seaboard, up and down the seaboard, <clears throat> in the 
even in this in the 1700s a lot of them were itinerant preachers some of them came over from england during the colonial period and they would minister to white audiences to black audiences to mixed audiences to indigenous people to prisoners and they were preaching the word of of god some of them we have from old documents i have um Patricia Cudwallader Hunt in my archives. She was speaking in the 1820s, Harriet Livingston. So I have a few of these very early preachers, but again, like a lot of the indigenous women, we, you know, we just don't have a record of them, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that many more now that we value women's voices or we're starting to value women's voices. I hope that transcripts will turn up showing. uh, I, it's- I bet they will. And I bet they will, especially also as a result of this wonderful book. So let's talk about a few outstanding women um, that who have really made who really made their mark through their words and pre- and speaking. Um, Sarah Parker Remond. Tell us right. about her. These are women that are all in my book that I've you know, put the spotlight on in my book. Sarah Parker Remen was amazing. She was born in Massachusetts of a free uh, black family and they were all, you know, abolitionists. She and her brother went and spoke around Massachusetts and New York about anti-slavery. This would have been in the um, 1850s, early 1850s before the civil war. Well, in 1859, the American Anti-Slavery Society sent her and her brother over to England, to the North of England, the prosperous, rich, bustling Manchester, Leeds, Lancashire County. They were bustling and thriving because of one thing, cotton, the cotton crop. So Sarah Parker Remen goes over there and speaks to all these communities and says to them, you are implicated in slavery because of cotton. Here you're making your living off of cotton. Your communities are actually Manchester. Manchester's nickname was Cottonopolis. The whole Uh, city had a huge cotton exchange. And she looked them in the eye, those audiences, mostly white audiences, and said to them, you are complicit. And and actually, it was a a tremendous controversy in the, you know, before the Civil War and, and during the years of the Civil War, whether the British would support the Confederacy. And in the end, Britain remained neutral. But um, I think that there's a good argument to make that Sarah Parker Remen had an influence on that because she stood up as a black woman and said, there are million, four million slaves, enslaved people in the south of, you know, in the southern part of the United States who are suffering because of cotton and because of your involvement. Can you imagine? Well, it's she She just said moral authority. Yeah. Facts, the moral authority, and she was a true, by all accounts, she was a terrific speaker. I mean, she just seems to have shown such bravery and courage in, um, and confidence in, you know, sharing that message. That's not an easy thing to do, certainly back then. No, very hard. And you for know, a black woman. No, of course. And you know what really, like, destroys me is that her brother, Charles Remen, has been much more better known than her. And you can find his speeches online. He's well known. And Sarah Parker Remen has only been in the last decade or so that people started to recognize her contributions. Wow. Talk about Grace, and I hope I pronounce her last name correctly. Grace Uyahara? Well, I I say Uyahara, but I'm not a Japanese. Okay. 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 But we should know that we're skipping way ahead we're skipping up from the 1859 to uh, 1980s, so 130 years. But Grace Uyahara was a, a Japanese-American woman, and she was just one of the, can you imagine this, 125, more than 125,000 people, American citizens of Japanese descent, who were rounded up and forcibly sent to internment camps at the very beginning of World War II with the Bop with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The minute Japan became um, our our enemy, our combatant enemy, all of the people of Japanese descent were considered suspect. And even though they were American citizens, and many of them had demonstrated their loyalty in a whole panoply of ways, they were considered um, suspect. And so their civil liberties were completely abrogated. And Grace Uyahara 
um, was one of quite a few who fought for recognition of this um, really terrible uh, outrage. And she uh, went to Congress and spoke in front of Congress. And I included in the book her testimony from the late uh, 1980s, in which she explained how that forced detention had affected her and her family. Of course, um, and it was it was famous. Um, was it was Executive Order 966, and it's gone down in history as a notoriously um, really evil evil um, act by the, the American government and Grace Uyahara petitioned for redress. And because of her, the, the United States government formally apologized to those citizens and gave reparation. I think each one got something like $20,000. So Donna, one of my questions is, and, and I, then I want, I want you to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt, who for many uh, American women is just such a hero. Um, do you think that women have a particular way and talent for being more transparent, for communicating with emotion and really tapping into their emotional intelligence in terms of their speaking style and, and content? Well, I'll tell you, Julie, I get, I get asked that question a lot. And I don't know whether... I don't know. I mean, the extent to which women and men are intrinsically different is one of the hot button issues of our day, of course. I don't have the competence to really weigh in on whether women and men are fundamentally different in, in what way and in, in the ways they express themselves. All I can speak to is what I have seen in the research that I've done. And I don't believe that women particularly speak with more emotion. I don't think that they speak with more emotional intelligence, more empathy, more charity than men do. When you look at the history of oratory, you see men who speak with their oh, their hearts open, they speak with compassion, and you see women who speak just as authoritatively. Right. But I will say this, when you look at gender roles throughout history, and you see that women were excluded from public roles, women were excluded from politics, women couldn't even vote in this country until the 1920, then you realize that women spoke about what they knew. And very often that was education. It was women's affairs, domestic and social affairs. It was women's lives. It was the family. Then of course, when we got to like the Victorian era, women were speaking about reform, prison reform, hygiene, like urban hygiene. Women moved into all these areas of reform. So I would say in terms of subject matter, yes. There has been a gender difference, but I, I actually don't believe that women intrinsically connect or convey more empathy or emotion. That's really interesting. Um, so bring us back to Eleanor Roosevelt and why she was such a, I don't know, a spark in terms of bringing women's voices to, to life. Well, for, I can think of two main reasons. Um, first of all, Eleanor Roosevelt used her voice like no other first lady did. In fact, you could say that she redefined what a first lady was in this country, the role of a first lady. She spoke. She, she spoke all the time. She actually went to events and spoke in front of people. She had a radio show, a radio program for during the war years. She had a newspaper column, My Day. I mean, she was so ahead of her time. She spoke all the time. And, you know, before that, the first lady was not considered someone whose views and opinions mattered or counted. But then the other reason I think she's so important is because she cannily used that visibility and voice to advance a progressive agenda that her husband, for various reasons, felt too confined by, pol by, by his political position to advance. So she spoke out for civil liberties she spoke out for black rights. She spoke out for working class people time and again. And especially when it comes to, um, to black rights, to African-American rights, you know, she, she did things for their PR value. Like for example, she, she was good friends with Mary McLeod Bethune. She made sure that she was seen with Mary McLeod Bethune in public and that the press photographed her. Hard to believe, but it was something, you know, that a lot of the public did not want to see the first lady with, a, you know, friends with a black woman. She invited 
black little black girls. I think they were Girl Scouts, little you know girls, to have a picnic on the lawn of the White House to show the world. And the speech that I have in my collection was a speech that she delivered to the Chicago Civil Liberties Committee just before the outbreak of World War II, in which she talked about the rights of black citizens and others. And she said, no one can, that our country cannot afford to deprive any citizen of, of his or her rights. So she was really a force for for the underdog, a force for marginalized people, and she pushed an agenda and pushed her husband in a direction that he wasn't comfortable moving in. Because of course, as a legend, you know, as the head of the country, he had to negotiate and he had to make deals with all kinds of Southern politicians. And he felt, you know, that he couldn't afford to take those positions in some kind, in some ways, very yeah. radical positions. Are, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question, but I have to ask it anyway. Who are the other first ladies after Eleanor Roosevelt who have followed in this vein? Well, in a sense, you could say every first lady after Eleanor Roosevelt, because she really set, broke the mold. Every first lady since then has felt comfortable, at least when asked, putting her opinions you know, out into the world and not being a hidden figure like... Oh, you know, well, I mean, I all of the first ladies before Eleanor and all the first ladies after Eleanor were completely different. Now, today, if you say which first ladies were most influential, it would be very hard pressed to say. Of course, I mentioned Hillary and Michelle Obama, but there were so many first ladies, all praise to Eleanor for breaking the mold and leading us in a new direction. And about Eleanor, I want to make one more comment. She was leading the initiative for the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the United Nations, which was of course formed right in the years after World War II. And she gave a, a historic speech in 1948 in which she talked about the importance of codifying rules that nations around the world would accept so that we'd agree that human beings all over the world have inalienable rights that should be defended and protected. Wow, amazing. What an inspiration. So who are some of the up and coming women of today who are making their mark through powerful oratory? Oh, well, there's so many. Um, I think to answer that question, I'll expand the lens and talk about women around the world because I, what, I, what really comes to mind is young women, young yeah. women who are role models for-, for I mean, the girl. one that I think of immediately is Greta Thunberg. Oh, she's fantastic. I'm Amazing. A, I just watched the documentary about her. I think it was on Netflix. I am Greta, it's called. I thought I knew a lot of, I thought I kind of pretty much knew the, you know, what was the deal with Greta. I learned so much and came to admire her um, so much more. And really she brought to attention the fact that it's young people, young people who are um, going to be suffering the effects of climate change the most because let's face it, old, you know, our life trajectories are shorter, but young people have their whole lives ahead of them. And she endured so much criticism and so much um, really approbation. So I have enormous respect for Greta Thunberg. And I think we've only just started to see. Oh, yeah. So the others that come to mind, of course, I, I have to mention Malala. Ah. I mean, I, what's often not appreciated about Malala Yousafzai is that when she was shot in the head um, by the Taliban, it wasn't a random attack. They targeted her because she was already using her voice. Right. She was standing up for girls' education in, in Pakistan. She was living in the Pashtun Valley and she, you know, her father was very liberal and was letting her go to school and be educated. And she went, she had a she was writing and she had a kind of radio program about women, women's education, and that's why they targeted her. But of course, if they thought they were gonna silence her, it had the opposite effect. She's become so much more, vote. she's an international, a global star. She's gotten the Nobel Prize. And she speaks out all the all the time for women's education, girls' education, and for using our voices. I really have a lot of respect for her. Oh, my, she is a remarkable young woman. And another woman who I have great respect for is Reshma uh, Sojani, um, who has started Girls Who Code. 
I write, I do a lot of work on LinkedIn for executives in the technology space and just think of her often, you know, about how she has um, spearheaded this effort to get women, to get young girls interested in STEM careers. I think it's very exciting. She's also, Resma Saljani, I'm so glad you mentioned her. She's also a great speaker. I uh, recommend that everybody go to YouTube and watch the commencement speech she just gave a few weeks ago at Smith College. It's it's truly extraordinary. It's one of the best commencement speeches I've ever heard. She's just such a compelling speaker, so inspiring. And she talks about, um, really, she talks about imposter syndrome and how none of us should buy into that malarkey, basically. <laughs> she's, oh, she's I'm going to so have to check, out, check that out. It's we have to end here. I mean, we could go on forever, Donna. This is so fascinating. Um, I'm waiting to get my copy of your book, so I can't wait to start reading it. Um, it's so, so right up my alley. So tell us again how people can access the Speaking Well Female Speech Bank. Sure. Well, the Speech Bank you can get at speakingwellfemale.co. And the book you can get at all major retailers. And I think I, what I want everybody to know is that this book and this these resources, women's speeches, belong in all young women's hands so that they can take heart from this and be inspired and encouraged to step up and use their own voices and put their own knowledge and expertise into the world. So That's it's a nice gift. Me. It's a very nice gift for a school library, <clears throat> right? <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much, Donna, for being with us today and check back soon for another edition of Quorum Live. Thank you.